Uh, okay. I met Jeremy Edmondson several years ago, and uh, a few years back I spoke at his church in Evansville, Indiana, and he has a wonderful ministry. You may have remembered that we featured it in our magazine, and we put some information about it. He's reaching out particularly to young people, and by young meaning 20s and 30s, and also people who are inner city. They, they uh, bought a building right in the heart of the uh, inner city Evansville. They're basically the only white church uh, surrounded by African-American churches and uh, African-American community. And uh, he has a very effective um, ministry. Uh, he's got a wonderful heart for the grace of God. And uh, I think you'll really enjoy him. And he's uh, one of our under 40 speakers. <laughs> I believe you said you're going to be 35 this Saturday, or is it 36? Oh, okay. Well, he, as far as I'm concerned, he could pass for 26. But in any regard, he looks great. Come on, Jeremy. Oh. And I forgot the title of your message. The title of your message. Ecclesiology in a postmodern age. Okay, if you don't know what this title means, then that's good because the title itself is to convey the sense of the postmodern age. No, go for it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you uh, for having me here, and, and um, let me just say a couple of things before I jump in. I thought of all different kind of introductory things I could say to kind of prep you for what I'm I'm going to to share. And I thought they all make me look like I'm in a bad light, so I didn't want to do that. <laughs> uh, um, let me just say this. Um, I'm indebted severely, he'll never know, to Bob Wilkin. Uh, with his ministry and, and his writings, um, has really helped me at a time um, when I had hit a wall with covenant theology and Calvinism and was getting no answers at all. And uh, it was very encouraging to me. And uh, uh, some of you in here who have written some things, I've, I've been scouring like crazy, reading everything that I can. And in some way or another, you've discipled me in these things. And so I'm, I'm very grateful to all of you who have done that. Uh, let me shamelessly plug something real quick. I don't, I don't believe Dr. Neonel is in here right now, but is he in here? No? Okay. He has a table out there with these. It is worth grabbing boxes they're free there's a hundred in each box take them to the post office mail them media mail back to your house so you don't have to take them on the plane or whatever if you're flying it is worth it we go into a correctional facility every sunday at noon and we work with with young people from the ages of 13 to 17 who beat up their mom got busted for doing drugs skipping school got into fights all kinds of crazy things that they're in there for and you ask them the question, can you tell me how to get to heaven? There's always a works answer. The one I love the best is when they say, well, you got to be a good person. So I'm sitting here in this correctional facility looking around the bars on the window, and I'm thinking, <laughs> that orange jumpsuit you've got on kind of testifies against you, doesn't it? <laughs> They're, it's interesting. They're very responsive. Well, let's, let's, it's not the free grace message. They're very responsive to the Bible. Let's just be honest. And to leave something like this in their hands, it, it, it's a, it does such a, a world of good. So I encourage you, uh, if you have to dump some of your clothes to put it in your suitcase, you can buy other clothes. This has much more eternal benefits. So, um, let's, let's start with prayer. Father, on this morning we come to you, um, probably a little overloaded uh, by all the brilliant things that, that uh, we've been able to learn uh, in the depths of your word, and, and uh, men and women who have uh, hearts that just want to know you and to draw close. Uh, what an encouragement, Lord. Uh, pray, Father, that you would be with us in this time. Uh, that we would have ears to hear and a heart that responds and, and, uh, and a, a new appreciation for the goodness of the Lord Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen. So I figured since this was more of a theological conference, I needed to give this a theological name. Um, 
Here's my question. Is the American evangelical church biblical? Now, immediately you're probably forming a could be, could not be in your mind, thinking through some things that you know. But here's what I'm finding as I'm looking at the landscape, and this has probably been mainly over the past 30 years when this happened, was a lot of people are emphasizing quantity over quality. It's all about numbers. And if you're familiar with any kind of business model, that's what's happening. The days of pastoring, in my perspective, and understand this is all in my perspective and opinion, have been set aside. And CEOs have been hired to run corporations. And so you have a lot of quantity, and let's be honest, very little quality that goes on in the church. Another thing is, is you've got a very much everybody come in mentality. But we're losing a lot of the go out mentality. And that bothers me. Another thing is, is we see a severe amount of entertainment in the church and very little equipping. If we had to characterize the American evangelical church, is that Jesus calling? <laughs> Speaking? Okay. If we had to characterize the American evangelical church, here are the things that I found that we would see as most prominent, which scares me because think about it. Why do you go to that church? The three main reasons why people go to church, do you have something for my kids? Is your bathroom clean? Which that's just, a, I mean, we talk about grace and truth, come on, you know? Do you have enough parking? These are the issues that matter today. And they are far removed from the word. I'm a little frightened by that. Here's our case number one. Houston, we have a problem. Lakewood Church. In 2005, 32,000 members. In fact, they bought the stadium that used to be the NBA Houston Rockets basketball team stadium. That's how much they have in weekly attendance. And then on Larry King Live, this interview. <laughs> Phoenix, Arizona. Hello. Hello, Larry. You're the best. And thank you, Joe, Joel, for your positive messages and your book. I'm wondering, though, um, why you sidestepped Larry's earlier question about how we get to heaven. Um, the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and the only way to the Father is through him. That's not really a message of condemnation, but of truth. Yeah, I would agree with her. I believe that. So that's that what Jew is not going to heaven. No, I, I, I mean, well, no, here's my thing, Larry, is I can't judge somebody's heart, you know. I don't know. Only God can look at somebody's heart. And so, I don't know. I just, to me, it's not my business to say, you know, this one is or this one isn't. I'm just saying, here's what the Bible teaches, and I want to put my faith in, uh, you know, in Christ. And I, I just, I think it's wrong when we go around saying, you know, you're not going, you're not going, you're not going, because it's not exactly my way. I'm just, I'm but not going to be the God. believe your way. I believe my way. I believe my way with all my heart. But For someone who doesn't share it, well, it is wrong. Isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I mean. Well, I don't know if I look at it like that. I would, I would present my way, but I'm just going to let God be the judge of that. Man, I don't know. I don't know. So you make no judgment on anyone? No, but I... About atheists? No, I just, you know what? I let, I let someone, let, I'm going to let God be the judge of who goes to heaven and hell. And I just, again, I present the truth. And I say it every week, you know, I believe it's a relationship with Jesus. But, you know what, I'm not going to go around telling everybody else. If, if they don't want to believe that, that's going to be their choice. God's got to look at your own heart. God's got to look at your heart. And only God knows that. You believe there's a place called heaven? I believe. <laughs> this is completely unrelated, but have you ever seen those cop shows where they say you can tell somebody's lying by how much they blink? That's completely unrelated, but um, anyway. So what can we deduce from this? How did such doctrinal uncertainty affect Lakewood's attendance in 2010? And I called them on their, their phone to talk to their secretary. That was interesting. Weekly attendance reached 44,800. What can we conclude? Gospel confusion equals numeric growth. 
Is that an equation that we're satisfied with? Willow Creek. Real quick, I name names, and you might frown upon that, but they're openly saying these things, so I see no problem in naming the names. Weekly, uh, sorry, Willow Creek self-study. The purpose of this survey was to measure spiritual growth. Now notice this, you've got four categories that you're dealing with here, and they're in descending order as far as levels of maturity. Christ-centered, close to Christ, growing in Christ, and exploring Christianity. Now, real quick. Anybody know what that means? Somebody want to guess? Somebody say, somebody speak up, it's okay. Seekers? Unbelievers. Seekers are unbelievers. These are people who were classified as, I believe God exists, but Jesus, and that's kind of what you get. Now we're doing a spiritual growth survey on this, which I think is interesting. Here's what Philip Yancey writes in Christianity Today, 2008. Study shows that while Willow has been successfully meeting the spiritual needs of those who describe themselves as exploring Christianity... Okay, stop. They're successfully meeting the spiritual needs of those who are exploring Christianity? Why are they still exploring Christianity then? Notice this. Or those that are growing in Christ, that's the next level, which, let's be honest, they're regenerate people. It has been less successful at doing so with those who self-report as being close to Christ or Christ-centered. In fact, one-fourth of the last two groups, the most mature groups, say that they are either stalled in their spiritual growth and or dissatisfied with the church. What is the result? While the lost are catered to, mature Christians are starving. Now, just keep these in your mind because I'm going to deal with them here in a second. Case number three. Anybody heard of New Spring Church? Perry Noble, pastor there. Nobody's heard of this? Okay, I was going to say, you guys need to get on the internet, man. It's a, it's a, it's a valuable tool. Valuable tool. <clears throat> so notice this. How would you welcome people to your church? Do we have our, our song leaders here? Are they here? Are they, excellent. I want you guys to put this in your repertoire for today. Because it's a great hymn of the faith. On, on Easter Sunday, about three years ago, I think it was, New Spring Church welcomed all with this beloved hymn of the faith. Now, I'm only going to play half of it. And here's the thing is, I'll just say this real quick. What I'm getting ready to show you, you might be offended by a little bit of it. But it's for the purpose of my talk. I'm not endorsing it personally. Please, please understand. <laughs> Was that in your guys' list of songs for today? I don't know what happened. I'm going down, party time, and all my friends are going to be there too. I'm on the highway to hell. This is how they welcomed people to their Easter service. Now, I, I read through the transcript part about his message. And, and you can do that. Look him up online, Perry Noble, Highway to Hell message, Easter service, or however you want to do that. And you can find transcripts of it and read through it. It's ridiculous. But yet 300 people came forward to meet Jesus. Everybody see that there's a problem there? Now, I'm not against rock and roll. I like it. In fact, I'm a drummer. I played in punk bands and went on tour for years. Uh, I love it. You guys see me up more close. I got tattoos all over. 
Uh, I'm still saved, okay? But <laughs> just making sure, I want you to know I have assurance. Um, but slightly letting you know. Um, but here's what's interesting is now, I, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm in common unity with you guys. I, I don't hold everything that MacArthur holds to, but I thought this was a good quote. There is simply no warrant in Scripture for adapting weekly church services to the preference of unbelievers. Indeed, the practice seems to be contrary to the spirit of everything Scripture says about the assembly of believers. When the church comes together on the Lord's Day, it is no time to entertain the lost, amuse the brethren, or otherwise cater to the felt needs of those in attendance. This is when we should bow before our God as a congregation and honor Him with our worship. You can agree with that. Now, here's the interesting thing. Where did all this originate to want to do something like this? The pastor. And so I found an interview of the pastor of why he chose these things. That's the other thing, though, James. That's the other thing. We really do have a heart. When we get together, we don't just get together and go, how can we piss a lot of people off? <laughs> I know. Highway to hell. That'll do it. I mean, we pray. We seek the Lord. We're asking we're begging for his direction it's not just me going i think i got a good shock effect thing this easter it's we really come together with a purpose of what do we really feel that god wants us to do in this earth how do you sought the lord and highway to hell was impressed upon your heart by the holy spirit <laughs> just ask him you know we have to laugh because it's sad you know Here's an interesting quote. Pastoral responsibility, which includes fidelity to Scripture alone, was never meant to be a popularity contest. If the line is drawn in any manner that is permanent, it will be done in the local church by pastors committed to orthodox understanding of theology and biblical interpretation. Resolved to resist the call of church growth experts or seeker-sensitive professionals, the pastor-teacher must give himself over to a thorough study of the Bible that is sound exegetically and orthodox hermeneutically. Agreed? That's who you need leading churches. Now here's an interesting thing. A couple of things I found from Barna. You might be familiar with his research. There's a disdain for discipleship. Barna notes that less than one out of every five self-identified Christians claims to be totally committed to investing in their own spiritual development. In another published survey, Barna notes that not quite half of all born-again adults participate in either a small group or Sunday school class during a typical week. I pastor a church of 20s, 30s, and 40s mainly, and I still have problems with them getting commitment. This generation has commitment issues. I don't know why, but they do. And it's bad because when it's pouring over into your growth and understanding more in the knowledge and grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've now got a massive problem that we're dealing with. So how did things go so wrong? Where did the church go so wrong? And I believe that the Bible gives us some interesting insights. With the introduction of the lost into the worship process of the church, praise has become performance. Scripture becomes storytelling. In fact, at a university in Tennessee, they offer a class on storytelling that many pastors are telling, or are taking, I'm sorry. Now, I understand there's various ways and methods to use. I get that. But I'm not here to tell stories. I'm here to proclaim the saving message of Christ. That's what it boils down to. The proclamation of truth has become a prescription for appeasement. Biblical fact number one, church is for saved people. Now hear me out and stone me later, okay? Take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts 5. I might be crunching my time here a little bit, and I, and I don't want to necessarily go too quickly, but I just want to show you some things that I think are interesting from the Word of God. We're, we're familiar with Ananias and Sapphira and the incident that happens there, but there's some, some very interesting things that are brought up afterwards that, that I would like to share with you. Uh, Acts chapter 5, let's look at verse 11. And great fear came upon the whole church after this thing happened, and upon all who heard these things. Now many signs, now notice, upon all who heard these things. Notice there's two groups of people, the whole church and all who heard these things. Everybody else who the mess who, who this reached, man, they just fell over dead. It was unbelievable. 
So watch what happens. Verse 12. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. Now watch this. None of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. The rest are the lost. But they held them. You couldn't help but to... We held them in high, high esteem. Because they were characterized by holiness. Because the Spirit of God was actively working amongst them. And look what it says. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. This is the formula generating holiness and reverence for God, seeking for His Spirit to move amongst people in the church. And those on the outside looking in and being like, that's a little freaky. But you can't help but to respect it. And I want to be a part of it. And the Lord adds people to the church. Here's another interesting passage. Go to 2 Corinthians 6. Yeah, everybody nimble up your right hand there so you can... Flip through the pages here. Second Corinthians chapter 6. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this passage used to talk about believers shouldn't marry unbelievers, and that's fine, but I don't find that in the context anywhere. So notice this. Second Corinthians 6. We're going to start in verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked. With unbelievers. And look how he explains this. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Does it have one? No. Look what else it says. Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? They don't. It's clear that Paul recognizes the possibility of defilement from partnering with the lost. It's detrimental. Biblical fact number two, the church should be equipped to go out. That's what happens. That's what should happen. Let's say it that way. Look over at Ephesians 4. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. Ephesians 4, look at verse 11. And he gave the apostle and prophets, right? Foundation was laid. We see that later, or or back in chapter 2 of this and 3. The evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, why? To equip, to make people adequate for something. A lot of people in churches today are running out fighting the gates of hell with a water pistol. It's not working. They get little small victories and then pummeled to the ground. They are not equipped. To equip, notice what it says here, the saints for the work of the ministry for building up the body of Christ. To equip them for the work of the ministry. I can't tell you how many times when some church or or a member of a church is asked in my area about, "Well, well, have you seen anyone come to faith in Christ lately? Well, not really, but that's what we hired our pastor for. (laughs) You hired one guy to do the work of an entire body of people. Wouldn't it make more sense? Well, wouldn't it make biblical sense to invest in and equip the people in the church? To go out and reach the people in these circles of influence, work, family, friends? Wouldn't that make sense? Isn't that where the truth needs to be? Yeah. Shouldn't we have a greater, at least a dispensing of the gospel in that manner? It just seems to make sense to me. And it makes biblical sense. Look what else he says here. The work of the ministry for the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Have we ever thought that this problem that seems to plague us with unity might find its roots all being built back in the fact that we're not equipping people and they're not out doing the work of the ministry. This seems to follow in a logical procession to me. Maturity is the missing result because many have gotten the equation all wrong. Earl Rodmacher, I miss him here. He's feisty. 
and he fires me up, and I love listening to him. To each individual member of the body is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Because of the sovereign distribution of the gifts, every member is absolutely indispensable to the function of the whole. Then, to the church are given specially gifted men as a provision for its spiritual increase. They are to equip the members, and the members are to be actively engaged in carrying out the work of the ministry. Good quote. And notice this. Every saint is important. Every saint is necessary. Every one. The body will not function properly if one is missing. It doesn't suffice to hobble in the Lord. Notice here, biblical fact number three, and I want to spend just a little bit of time on this. Colossians 1, verse 28. This is one of those brick verses. You read it and you feel like you got smacked with a brick. I love this verse. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone. Right? Notice what it says here. With all wisdom. Pastor's got to study. Osmosis exegesis never helped anybody. (laughs) It said here that we may present everyone mature in Christ. If you teach the Bible, raise your hand. You might not know this, but you do today. This is your verse. This is your verse. You proclaim Christ and you warn and you teach because both are going to be needed. You're dealing with believers, it gets messy. Warn them and teach them with all wisdom. Know our stuff. That's one of the big reasons why I like coming here. Y'all, and originally I'm from Kentucky, I'm a missionary to Indiana, but (laughs) y'all, Ken Yates, right? Amen, Amen, brother. Y'all have wisdom that helps me from your studies to gain wisdom in the scriptures. You are building me up and helping me to see things that I previously hadn't seen before. It's a blessing. Don't take it for granted, man. Real quick, at my church I speak in slang a lot, so if you need an interpretation later, let me know. Y'all are a bunch of smart dudes. And I appreciate that. I appreciate it so much. Warn them. Teach them. With all wisdom. Why? Because how glorious is it going to be to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, presenting people under your tutelage, sheep that you have helped along, that you have stewarded the Lord's sheep unto him, and they are mature in Christ. That's the goal. Maturity is the goal. Maturity is the goal. Everybody get that? Yeah. Here's a great quote. Understanding Christian theology, that big thick book, Swindoll and Zuck edited it. Anybody got copies of that? It's on Logos. I encourage you to get it, man. It's, I, I wish it wouldn't have went out of print. It is an excellent book. Excellent. Jesus the Sovereign came to serve. The style of church mission is thus set firmly in the servant mold. A servant church is in contrast to a church obsessed with its own power. Following the explicit words of our Lord, the church is to be a preaching, witnessing, caring, discipling church. There is no avoiding it. Evangelism is the mission of the church. And here's what I loved. Sinners are not commanded to go to church. Anybody here going to Elk Lodge later on this evening? You're probably not going. Why? Because you don't belong there. You're not a sacred elk of the high order of whoever. You see what I'm saying? If you don't belong to the group, you don't show up there. So notice this. Because sinners have felt so, I don't know, church people are kind of weird. They're all judgmental, right? Oh, well, we don't want to judge you. So we'll scale it back a little bit. 
And we don't want to talk about sin, and we don't want to talk about hell, we don't want to definitely talk about the lake of fire, we don't want to talk about death, we don't want to talk about how you can't save yourself. It blows my mind because a lot of, a lot of sermons that I hear or read today, you get a lot of information online, get online, it's, it's not bad. But it'd be something that you'd find in a Reader's Digest edition. Stories, antidotes, I did this with my kids. Where's Jesus in all this? Sinners are not commanded to go to church. The church is commanded to go to sinners. Get Living Waters booklets. Get a tract. Tracts are old-fashioned. No, tracts help provide the information when you can't be there. Give them to people. Go to a restaurant. Leave a good tip. (laughs) Put a tract on there. A lot more likely to read it if you tip them well. Well, They didn't give me very good service. Well, stop being so selfish, man. Their spirit's in the balance here. They could hear the words of life and be saved. See how crucial this kind of stuff is? And here's the great thing that I love that the Lord has set up. There's lost people everywhere. (laughs) Never thought of that, have we? (laughs) They're everywhere. And here's one thing. They've been told so much works based salvation message stuff that they are hungry to hear about the grace of God. Many modern tactics in the church are designed to bring the lost into the church. This excuses the church from their God-given responsibility to go to the lost. The result is capitulation and compromise. That's what we've done. This problem is most evident in the emerging church movement. The thing I think is interesting about the emergent church movement is that I always hear them describe, they're characterized by one thing, like nailing jello to a wall. And here's the scary thing about it. A lot of people are going there and no one is coming to Christ. They might think they are, but let's be honest, if they don't know what Jesus is promising, they are lost people. If they have not trusted in that, they are lost. Churches full of lost people. Incredible. The answer to this big problem has become Lordship Salvation. Here's how we're going to answer this postmodern drift into oblivion. Here's how we're going to take care of this problem. Legalism has demanded commitment beyond the bounds of Scripture's call to believe in Christ. This has corrupted the saving message of faith alone and Christ alone, thus being no saving message at all. Lordship salvation is the Talmud of evangelical Christianity. You might as well take your Bible and get a whole bunch of papers with some other stuff on it and cover your Bible up. Scary stuff. You guys hold to your traditions more than the words of my father. Shameful. It really is. Now, why does this matter to free grace believers? And I think this is where the issue really nails it. Both Calvinism and Arminianism are really Roman Catholicism in a new dress. Let's just be honest. Both have robbed the believer of their assurance and essentially denied the sufficiency of the finished work of Christ. Those holding to the free grace perspective are the only ones upholding the truth of the scriptures and keeping the gospel unadulterated by works. We are the only ones. Get this. This is not a lie. This isn't my opinion. When you look at the landscape, and we've talked about every time you look in the commentaries, here's what you find, the reformed position. When we are the only ones proclaiming the sufficiency of Christ to save completely. Now, John Piper is not the pastor of Bethlehem anymore. But the number one thing that his church struggled with is assurance. Because when you've had someone for 30 years touting, and he considers himself a seven-point Calvinist, (laughs) when you are touting that to your people, indoctrinating this 
for 30 years. Think about the problem with this. People are scared. What else do I have to do for God to accept me? That message does not proclaim the glory of God. That's what I love about Reformed people. They wax eloquent about the glory of God all the time. And they're always talking about the sufficiency of the gospel in this. They do not preach sufficiency. They tell you that Jesus got you about 98% there. And if you act well and do okay, you might be able to fill in that gap and achieve that end. Is that a savior you can trust? It gets tiresome after a while. Anybody tried to live according to the law in your Christianity? It's tiresome, isn't it? It leads one place, death. It's sad. It breaks my heart. It does. You guys in here that write books, deep down, I envy you. I do. But keep writing. I don't know if you've noticed this, but every Christian publisher is dominated by Calvinism and Reformed theology. In fact, I think Bob mentioned this one time. Um, whenever they came out with What Love Is This by Dave Hunt, I'm pretty sure that the Calvinists ran that publisher out of business. Where's the love in that? It's heartbreaking, isn't it? See, here's the interesting thing that I love about free grace. Is that, is that it's not so much a movement and it's not... What it really is, is it's a hermeneutic. It really is a means of understanding the scriptures. What drew me to free grace was, is I couldn't reconcile all these passages. And I got tired of trying, and I got tired of pushing, and I got tired of... Man, I got tired. <laughs> you know? And I'll never forget, one day it hit me, I was in my office and I turned around in my little swivel chair and I looked at my bookshelf covered with Spurgeon, MacArthur, Piper, Sproul, all these guys. And I remember saying, oh my gosh, you're all wrong. It bothered me. Because I looked up to these guys. And then I sit there and thought about how much money I'd wasted on these people. <laughs> I could. Let's be honest. But I tell you, man, when the light hit me, gosh, it was so good. And you couldn't help but to want to tell people, and it didn't throw me into licentiousness. <laughs> Regardless of what people want to say. Oh, we can just do whatever. No! There are biblical consequences now. The free grace camp has God's truth. No other division of the theological landscape offers the clear message of the offer of eternal life through faith in Christ alone. We must equip believers inside to reach the lost outside so that those outside can believe and be brought inside. Pastors, challenge your people with hard stuff. It's okay. The sheep can think. <laughs> they, we've always heard they're dumb or sheep are stupid. Guess what? They don't have to stay that way. <laughs> they don't. They don't. And offer the message of grace to lost people. Anybody ever stop to think that the Bereans weren't regenerate? They heard it and went back and searched the scriptures to see if it was so. Why? Because they didn't believe it was so. And so they're unregenerate, unregenerate, aroused by their curiosity and the work of the Holy Spirit, doing something in them that made them want to know. We have an onslaught of new Calvinism that's, that's on the landscape right now. Kyle Eidelman, 
David Platt, Mark Driscoll. Um, who else? Francis Chan. Anybody read Crazy Love? Crazy Man. <laughs> Lukewarm Christians are not really saved. Now, I'm not here to judge anybody. Of course, we're saved by grace through faith alone. Man, they know how to tout the terminology, but they have reinterpreted the definitions. And it is, it is, it is, it is saving no one. It is saving no one. That's a problem. It's him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom, always studying, so as to present everyone. Present to who? Think about it. As mature in Christ. I encourage you, take the time to mature your people and lead them in evangelism. Learning how to evangelize is just part of discipleship, isn't it? We wonder why evangelism is such a problem. Disciple our people and it'll stop being a problem. Pray with me. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would grant to us refreshed understanding and hearts about how good your grace is. Lord, the church is in bad shape. Your body looks beaten and bruised. And let's just be honest, some of it's not your body at all. Thank you, God, for opening the scriptures to our understanding and using people like Bob, and Zane, and Steve Lewis, and John Niamh, Lord, to encourage us and to point us in a direction of faithfulness to your word and to what it clearly tells us. And I pray, Father, as we, as we leave here this afternoon, you would provide with us many opportunities to tell people about faith alone and Christ alone for the gift of eternal life. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.